So um, just to introduce you guys to New Entry Sustainable Farming Project. Um, we are um, a nonprofit project of Tufts University and Third Sector New England. We do on the ground work with farmers in Massachusetts and provide beginning farmer training. And we have a food access program. Um, here in Lowell, Massachusetts, we have an incubator farm and a farm business planning course. We also operate a food hub uh, where we aggregate produce from our farmers and local farmers and run a CSA. Um, and our food hub actually serves as a market for our, um, our farmers and our graduates of the um, farm business planning course. And we also have a farmland matching program. And we also have a national reach as well. So we provide training and technical assistance for, um, for farmers. Um, we do some, uh, we have farm incubator project outreach nationally, as well as training in TA for CFP applicants and grantees, uh, hence this webinar. And we also provide support to applicants of the Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program grant of the USDA. Um, I'll also plug our two national conferences that we have coming up. We do an annual um, conference for beginning and incubator farmer training. And this year it's going to be in Pacific Grove, California in November. Uh, and I also want to plug our Community Food Systems Conference that's coming up in Boston this December. So we hope to see everyone there. Um, it's going to be a really great event, bringing together lots of folks from Community Food Systems work nationally. Um, just to dive into a little bit more of the CFP support that we provide. Um, so New Entry was awarded a training and technical assistance grant from the USDA to support applicants and grantees of the Community Food Projects Grant. Um, I've put our website there, so hopefully if you haven't already uh, visited that website, it's chock full of resources, past webinars, lots of um, tips and toolkits. Um, grant writing guides and stuff like that for CFP. Uh, the one-on-one -on -one assistance we provide for potential applicants and applicants as well as grantees can include anything from answering your questions via email to setting up one-on-one -on -one phone calls to hear more about your potential projects as you develop them. Um, and we also have a TA referral program where we can refer you to one of our partner organizations or consultants around the country based on your needs and uh, our partner's expertise. So please keep that in mind as the um, RFA time approaches. Um, we're here to help you out. And again, there's my name and email address if you have any questions along the way during the RFA period or today or this week or whenever. Great, so um, let's dive into what the Community Food Projects Competitive Grant Program is all about. Um, the CFP grant program is a program of the USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture. So um, if you hear me referring to NIFA throughout the webinar, that's what, um, that's what arm of the USDA I'm referring to. The program started back in 96 with um, the main priorities of fighting hunger and promoting self-sufficiency in low-income communities. Uh, the main goals of the CFP program uh, are to meet the food needs of low-income individuals, to increase the self-reliance of communities and providing for the food needs of those communities, to promote comprehensive responses to local food access, farm, and nutrition issues, and to meet specific state, local, or neighborhood food and agricultural needs. Um, and here I just want to reiterate the importance and the priority of um, serving low-income community members and promoting self-reliance. Um, so it's, it's projects that encourage and assist with entrepreneurship and skill building, education, training um, and comprehensive responses are really encouraged. And so that means ensuring that your project is connecting and engaging multiple sectors and addressing your community food issues and challenges. Um, it means 
uh, innovation is really prioritized among community food projects. And the grant program really wants to address food security and nutrition needs in a collaborative way that incorporates strategies like job creation, as I said, and promoting skill building. So now I'll talk about funding. Um, the past, in the past, um, availability of dollars awarded was $8.6 million for the last fiscal year round. Um, and there are two uh, types of CFP grants that you can apply for. There's the implementation grants or the planning grants. Um, most of the funding goes toward implementation grants. And applicants can request a maximum of $400,000 for over four years for implementation grants. Um, and $35,000 maximum for up to three years for planning grants. So a planning grant um, could be a food system assessment or a feasibility study or something preliminary like that. Um, but like I said, most of the funding goes toward implementation grants. Um, if you have any questions about what might be a good planning grant, we can get to that later in the Q&A section. Um, one really, really, really important thing to note about CFP is the match requirement. There is a dollar for dollar match requirement for CFP. That means if you're requesting $350,000, you need to demonstrate $350,000 um, of match at the time of application. That can be in kind or cash, but the cash, it can't be from federal funds. And like I said, that does need to be demonstrated at the time of application, and a lot of organizations struggle with this. Um, so I encourage you to think about it among your organization and partners very early on. Um, the way you demonstrate that is through um, letters of commitment from your donors or whoever's providing that in-kind match. Um, and that also needs to uh, state the estimated value of the in-kind commitment if you're, if you're showing in-kind. Um, so the in-kind can um, include things like uh, donations or other grants from non-federal sources, uh, staff and volunteer time for the project, facilities, equipment, or services. Um, but they all must be specifically used for the project. So I recommend reading last year's RFA, which is posted on our website, um, on our CFP resources page, and it covers a lot of details on allowable matching. And NIFA also has resources on its website, and we also have a lot of other uh, resources on our webpage that can uh, go deeper into the match requirement. Um, I anticipate a fair number of questions about um, the match, so we'll try to get to those later. Um, move on to eligibility. So eligible applicants include nonprofits, uh, tribal organizations, and public food service providers. If you're a nonprofit organization but you don't have a 501c3 status, um, you can use a fiscal sponsor as your lead applicant. Um, for instance, new entry, we don't have 501c3 status. Our fiscal sponsor is Third Sector New England, so they're technically our um, the lead applicant on our CFP grant. Um, so the important thing is that the lead applicant have experience in uh, community food work, um, particularly concerning small and medium-sized farms, including the provision of food to people in low-income communities, and the development of new markets in low-income communities for agricultural producers, or job training and business development activities um, for food-related activities in low-income areas, or uh, efforts to reduce food insecurity in low-income areas. Um, it's also important to demonstrate competency to implement a project, so providing fiscal accountability, collecting data, preparing reports, um, Stuff like that, the thing to bear in mind is that this is a federal grant. Um, it's important to remember that there's a lot of management involved, so keep that in mind as you put together your application. Um, 
So the USDA and we want to make sure that you have the time and capacity to administer and report on your grant. So that involves keeping records and knowing how to measure and demonstrate your, your progress and your impact along the way. And a lot of that can involve a lot of uh, management. Um, it's also important to demonstrate a willingness to share the information um, through your project with researchers and evaluators um, and other interested parties. And it's important to collaborate with one or more local partner organizations to achieve at least one hunger-free communities goal. Um, more information on that can be found in the RFA. Um, so I just want to reiterate that partnerships are very important for CFP. And I'll get to uh, dive into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, so the application process. Um, so the RFA is released annually. We anticipate that it will be announced this October, but we do not know for sure, and we're not sure of uh, the date there. So last year, the, um, the RFA opened October 7th, and applications were due November 30th. Um, and that's a pretty quick t turnaround time. Um, so I, it might seem like a lot of time because it's over a month, but it's um, it's really not. It's a federal grant and there's a lot to prepare. So <laughs> just keep that in mind. Um, also keep in mind that the award decisions and announcement might not come for another um, close to a year later. So for instance, the folks who applied um, last November, I don't believe, I don't know that they've received their decisions yet. Um, I could be wrong, but new entry typically uh, is notified when awards have been made and we haven't heard yet. So we anticipate that's coming very, very soon. Um, but just to give you an idea of that time frame, so you'll be applying this fall and not necessarily hearing back about the decision until the following fall. Um, you'll apply through grants.gov. Um, again, if you've never been on grants.gov or if you've never applied for a federal grant before, it's really, really important to check that out now. Um, today, this week, go on grants.gov, um, uh, sign up. I think you have to apply for a, a profile. It's all free and, and pretty easy to do, but it does take some time. Um, and we're certainly here to help you out with that. Um, it can be a little bit daunting putting together a federal grant application. So I will just plug that we have an application process webinar planned for October, uh, where we will be diving into more of the application process um, in detail. So stay tuned for more information on that. We haven't scheduled it yet, but you'll be hearing about it as soon as we do. Um, so CFP applications go through a peer review process. Um, NIFA has a team of experts and community food security professionals who um, review the applications. Uh, ultimately, the decision is um, of the awards is through the USDA, but they do rely heavily on the opinions and the input of the uh, panel. And I also just wanted to note that 18% um, that of applications were funded in fiscal year 2016. So that hopefully just gives you an idea of how competitive the grant, um, the CFP grant process is. Um, so earlier I had mentioned the importance of community engagement, and this is really, really integral to the CFP program. Um, this is, is one of the most important elements to a successful CFP proposal. So in your proposal, you're going to need to demonstrate um, community engagement in your project planning process and project implementation. Um, you need to demonstrate to the USDA that you have the buy-in, the commitment, and leadership from your stakeholders, your community members, those who you plan on serving through the project. Um, it's really important to work on it before the RFA is released, so I'll stress that again. Um, if you're not already engaging the folks you plan to um, possibly involved in the project, um, if you're thinking about putting together a project, 
then um, it's really important to start that now. Um, and we have some really great resources and tools for how to um, involve your community on the planning level, uh, such as the Inclusive Engagement Toolkit, which we, I'm going to send it out to you guys, but it's also posted on our website. Um, the Inclusive Engagement Toolkit was created just a few years ago by a Tufts graduate student. Um, it focuses on building grassroots participation from those you serve and building a shared vision with partners in an inclusive and participatory process. Um, there's a lot of key words in that sentence, but I'll just highlight the word inclusive. <laughs> um, it contains a tons, tons and tons of tips and a lot of related resources to help you integrate multiple voices into the planning and implementation of your project. Um, it's a really, really awesome resource. So like I said, I will include that in my follow-up email to you guys, and it's also posted on our CFP resources page. Um, the indicators of success. Um, this is a report compiled um, for USDA each fiscal year. Um, it's based on the whole measures for community food systems, which was developed by the Community Food Security Coalition. And it's a values-based planning and evaluation tool specifically for community food security projects. Um, so whole measures digs into six major categories, healthy people, strong communities, thriving local economies, vibrant farms and gardens, um, sustainable ecosystems, and justice and fairness. And the indicators of success is a way for the USDA to see how the community food projects are measuring their impact and what their collective impact is. New Entry will send out a survey each year to collect information from CFP grantees as well as from beneficiaries of those projects. And we summarize all the data into a report and our most recent report for 2016 is available on our website. I'm happy to share that with you all as well so you can get an idea of the types of activities and evaluation metrics that grantees are utilizing. Um, so here are just a few of the many, many activities that grantees are utilizing um, and the percentage of projects that are utilizing those activities. So food access and outreach, nutrition and health education, local food distribution, job skills, capacity building, community gardens, and promoting local food purchases. Um, the indicators of success also, like I said, surveys the beneficiaries. Um, so you can see the number um, from 2016 projects, the number who were food recipients, direct customers, uh, which beneficiaries are attending events and who participated in training. Um, CFP prioritizes food production that uses um, sustainable and earth-friendly methods. And here you can see the types of growing practices that uh, projects utilize, either in their own production or food purchases. And um, we also like to get a sense of the opportunities that are created through community food projects. Um, so these volunteer opportunities and partnerships leveraged resources available to community food projects, strengthened relationships, and helped create stronger communities. In addition to forming new partnerships and getting volunteers involved, community food projects created new leadership opportunities in their communities. Um, so of the 367 new leadership roles created in fiscal year 2016, 70% of those were filled by people of color and 38% were engaged in youth. Um, so I chose a couple of examples of um, CFP projects out there to just familiarize um, you with what things look like, who's doing what. Um, so I chose the Crossroads Community Food Network, um, cultivating new food and entrepreneurs and scaling up businesses to create self-sufficiency in the Tacoma Langley Crossroads. Um, so they're, um, the Tacoma Langley Crossroads community in Maryland um, 
ha is a mostly immigrant low income community. Um, they have low food self sufficiency and high food insecurity, especially among minorities. Um, here I, I have their um, project goal and some of their matching objectives. Um, so basically, the organization they saw a lot of demand for licensed kitchen space in their community, um, as well as demand for training specifically for creating new food businesses. Um, so led by the Crossroads Community Food Network, the projects connect various sectors of their local food system from production and processing and marketing and um, retail to preparation and consumption on the consumer side. So they're linking um, their farmer's market to a new community kitchen and encouraging new partnerships with local markets and food stores as well. Um, and here, I am not going to read this, but this is a snapshot of, of the evaluation plan that the Crossroads Community Food Network submitted for their uh, community food project proposal. Um, I just wanted to share an example of what an evaluation plan looks like. Um, and, and like I said, I'll be sharing these slides with you later so you'll be able to look at it more closely. Um, but you can kind of see how so their outcomes measurement um, will tie back into the data that we collect for our indicators of success. Um, and I think that this is just a great example of um, a you know, clear, well put together evaluation plan for a CFP. And the next example I chose was a group called Appetite for Change in Minnesota, um, the Northside Fresh Community Food Project. Um, so through the Northside Fresh brand, community-based partners change the way food is produced, marketed, distributed, and consumed in uh, North Minneapolis. So their project includes a fruit and veggie prescription incentive program, uh, community aggregation and distribution, a local farmer's market, an urban farmer's collaborative, food business incubator, and a real food cafe that double as a youth training and employment program. Um, the project was born out of the Northside Fresh Coalition and is rooted in a three block stretch of uh, West Broadway Avenue uh, in Minneapolis, which is the main commercial corridor of a community that's really rich in culture, culture social capital, and innovative ideas. Um, so there are their project goals. Um, like I said, they're coalition-led, and they used data that was gathered from a youth-led local food assessment that found that there was a, a, a large number of fast food and junk food serving stores in the area and really limited um, options for healthy food. Um, so like I said, they're operating a wide range of activities that includes a farmer's market with a SNAP incentive program. Um, and with the, the veggie prescription program, they work in partnership with doctors at the local university. They also work with backyard gardeners to use gap procedures and develop food safety plans. And their cafe serves affordable, healthy, and locally produced food. And they also run an incubator and commercial kitchen that offers technical assistance and cooking classes for the local community. Um, so these are the major takeaways from um, the presentation thus far. So um, getting back to the main, I guess, priorities of CFP, I just want to reiterate that projects must engage and serve low-income individuals and uh, promote self-reliance and should focus on inclusive community engagement. And again, uh, I want to drive home that dollar-for-dollar -dollar match requirement is really important to consider. Um, and also that it's super important to start the process early, take a look at um, examples of the application form through grants.gov, uh, sign up for our webinar in October, look at some of the resources that we have, and there's our website again. Um, and here's how to get to our website. <laughs> so uh, nesfp.org. 
um, and then hover over national and state networks, and then scroll down under community food projects. You have um, all of the um, all of the resources that we offer for applicants and grantees, and then we have um, past webinars recorded and posted on our website, um, and we also have a YouTube channel. So those a lot of those should be there too. Um, and the next resource I wanted to highlight is actually NIFA's uh, main community food projects uh, website. So um, if you if you go to that main page and scroll down, you'll be able to see abstracts of funded projects. And I think it's really cool. You can see um, there's an abstract and then like a larger summary from the proposal of I think every funded CFP thus far, or at least for the last several years. Um, so I would highly recommend checking that out. Um, and it has information on how much each project was awarded and the length of time, um, as well as the main uh, lead applicant and the, um, the main project goals and objectives. And for those I think that have uh, maybe finish their project. It has some impact um, data, or at least a summary. So um, I will include the URL to this page um, in my follow-up email to you guys. I think it's a really good thing to check out. Again, we have an upcoming webinar on the application process. Um, New Entry will be hosting it in October. We don't have a date set yet, but um, because we have all of your emails captured, you'll be sure to be included on that, so stay tuned. All right, so we have about a half hour for Q&A. Um, I have my colleague Kristen Aldrich here to help field questions. She's amazing at that. And um, I also have my email address thrown up here, and I would um, love to hear any follow-up questions that you have that are more specifically focused on your project. Um, and um, if we get to anything that I don't know that Kristen and I don't know the answer to today, we would be happy to uh, follow up with you. Um, so if you want to go ahead and utilize your chat feature or your Q&A feature, um, yeah, this is Kristen Aldrich here, and um, just wanted to say I've been trying to keep up in the chat box and answer questions throughout. As folks uh, may have chatted questions into the box uh, during the presentation, but some I think are, I you know, could be beneficial to the whole group. So I want to share some of those and hopefully get to any that I might have missed thus far. Um, but one is clarifying that this is $400,000 over four years, which would be about $100,000 per year. Um, so that is correct. It would be a total of $400,000. Um, someone had asked about repeating the match amount example. I'm not sure if um, a specific example was given, but um, the match amount would be 100%, um, and that was another clarifying question throughout from at least one other participant here today. So the match is 100%, and that is on your total requested funds, which does include your indirect. Um, it is possible to use indirect costs as part of your match. Um, so not to sort of confuse things there, but whatever your whatever your total requested amount might be, you do need to match dollar for dollar what that is. Um, so when you're filling out your application form, it would be in that non-federal column. It should be the same amount as in the federal column, which is the amount requested. Um, hopefully that is clear. Um, another thing I'll say, and I am, am quick to refer most folks to the awards management division. They are, they have, you know, all of the expertise and background and are 
the main folks to be contacting for any questions related to the financial piece of your application, anything match related, indirect cost, if you have questions about your indirect cost rate. Um, the awards management division would be the, the people to be in touch with about that. And the two main contacts there, and we can include their email addresses and information when we follow up, uh, but they would be Adrian Wooden and Susan Bowman uh, through NIFA. Um, and again, we can send that information along. Um, so just to keep scrolling through some other questions here. Um, let's see. Also related to uh, match, uh, someone was asking about calculations for volunteer time um, and how to properly calculate the value of volunteer hours. And I did share in the chat box to all participants, um, if you just go online and Google volunteer hour valuation or something along those lines, there are some resources that uh, have some estimations of what that can be. So I shared one link, and again, we can send this out to the group following the webinar. Uh, but there's a resource, Philanthropy News Digest, that has a valuation for volunteer hours on there. It's about $23 per hour. Um, but with volunteer time, you can also adjust that depending on what kind of a role the volunteer is serving. If it is something, you know, a little more highly skilled, then you can, um, you know, maybe do some research and check out what kind of volunteer rates make the most sense if someone is providing greater expertise on a volunteer basis. Um, and it might not be exactly what you might pay a consultant for the same, the same job, but you can kind of increase that valuation potentially. Um, someone also asked if a public school system is eligible to apply. So again, for CFP, it would be nonprofit organizations, uh, tribal groups, and they have that, um, I believe they state it as public food service organizations. Um, so I, I don't believe a public school system would fall into any of those categories. Um, but I, again, I would maybe contact either awards management division or the, um, the primary sort of grant uh, program contact for CFP, um, which will be Paul Cotton in conjunction with Jane Clary. Um, who is going to be serving as a co-leader on the CFP program moving forward. Um, but that said, for any organization that is a part of a CFP project, um, you can have your primary applicant be a 501c3 nonprofit um, or something along those lines, one of the eligible entities. And then uh, you can have a partner um, that that has you know a contribution into the project that is not one of those um, one of those eligible entities. So a public school system, for example, could certainly partner on a CFP project. There was also a question about the number of applicants that were submitted for CFP last year, and I believe it was about 185 uh, total applicants and 18% were funded, as we mentioned. Um, it was a total of 33 projects that were funded. Um, yeah, other questions around the indirect cost rate. So again, if you have a federally negotiated indirect cost rate, I was just going back into the RFA to read through that language. Um, again, I can't stress enough any financial questions um, or budget-related questions, please, you can always uh, contact the awards management division. But um, CFP does have the 10% de minimis for indirect cost. So if you do not have a federally negotiated rate, 10% would be the kind of default from my understanding. Um, and so when you're calculating your total request, you would include direct plus indirect as that total requested funds. Um, again, which the, the total would have to be matched 100%. Um, 
Um, and so let's see. Someone asked, is this program funded via cost reimbursement or may grantees draw down funds in advance of purchases? Um, so um, I believe this program, CFP, uh, in terms of the budget and your funds, that would be available through the ASAP.gov um, mechanism. And so you can draw down your funds in advance of purchases as opposed to cost reimbursement. There's another question about fiscal sponsors and what does that entail? Um, if, if you are fiscally sponsored by another entity um, that essentially carries a 501c3 or other kind of nonprofit IRS status for you, uh, sort of on your behalf, then uh, technically the primary applicant for your grant would be that fiscal sponsor. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Um, if you don't have a fiscal sponsor, if you do own your own 501c3 nonprofit or otherwise are incorporated yourself um, as a nonprofit or one of the eligible entities, then um, you wouldn't need to worry about the fiscal sponsorship piece. Can I jump in? Yeah. Um, there's a question, does the project need to serve only low-income populations or be inclusive of but not limited to low-income populations? Um, yeah. Let, sorry, one more time. Uh, does the project need to serve only low-income populations or be inclusive of but not limited to low-income populations? Um, yeah, I believe it should be inclusive of, but does not have to be limited to low-income populations. That, again, is a major focus of the CFP grant program and um, the populations to serve. Um, but they are, they're kind of looking at underserved populations of, you know, of various sorts, I suppose. Um, so if there are some folks that would benefit from your project that are not, you know, technically considered within a low income bracket, I think that is okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there should be a main a main focus or thrust of your work for this project specifically that is very much focused on underserved populations. Um, I hope that helped. Um, so let's see here. A number of questions have come through. Um, trying to go back through here and address them chronologically. So uh, another question about partnering with a local business. Um, what are the limitations in working with local businesses, i.e., what can we and can't we pay for when it comes to working with private businesses? Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I might need more specific information about that. Um, that came from uh, Liana. If you want to follow up with us directly, Liana, and ask about that working with local businesses piece, um, I'm not sure. I guess it depends on the kind of expense and if it's considered an allowable expense according to the budget restrictions for this grant program. Um, but as long as it falls within allowable expenses, you should be fine. Uh, but again, feel free to follow up directly uh, with me or Kristen via email. Um, how much funding has been allocated this year? We don't have that information yet. We'll, we will know when our day comes out, which again, we're still estimating to be around October, uh, similar timing as in previous years. Um, so we'll see at that time. I believe in the past two years, it's been about eight and a half million dollars uh, of total funds available for projects each year. Um, and it's a, been a similar number of projects funded. So um, yeah, we are, you know, again, we there's sort of no guarantees. We're not sure exactly what's going to happen. Um, so we'll see when the RFA comes out, but we would anticipate a similar trajectory for this year. Um, because you, let's see here. 
because you are applying for a grant that will not be awarded for a year from application, is there going to be an expectation that you explain your project expectations of that gap year? That's a good question. I feel like the timing is important to note. I think Kristen mentioned this in the presentation as well. Um, but there, I, I don't believe, I mean, so when you're applying and putting together your proposal, it is for the grant project period. So there is not necessarily a need to explain what you're going to do within the year in between applying and potentially being awarded. Um, you know, potentially in some aspects of your application, you might have room to explain that, um, you know, you, your organization is well positioned for this project because of X, Y, and Z, and there might be an opportunity to describe what work you're doing within that gap year, as, as you mentioned. Um, but you, you are applying for a project within that grant time frame. Um, in this case, it would be September, I believe, September of 2000, <laughs> let's, let's see, September 2018 through the following year, September 2019. Um, let's see. Um, another question about um, in-kind donations. Uh, you mentioned that in-kind donations may include volunteer time, facilities use, equipment, or services use. Would an estimated dollar value of those things be calculated and then counted toward match? Um, they certainly could be, um, depending upon the, the type of, I guess, equipment or services um, that you are including in your match. One restriction for match and for um, those budget specifications is that it must come in, um, I think, the, uh, the farthest in advance, um, that, uh, something that you're getting in kind um, could, be, could be sort of counted toward your projects would be 90 days before the project starts. Um, so depending on what equipment you're referring to in terms of using that as match, um, it would kind of depend on the timing of when you're, you're purchasing or acquiring that piece of equipment. Um, but yeah, certainly volunteer time, um, anticipated facilities use for a workshop or training, um, services that a partner organization might provide, those could all be um, calculated and counted towards your match with an estimated dollar value. Um, so they just ask for documentation of those in-kind uh, donations and match amounts. Um, does a nonprofit organization include a county-sponsored food policy council? Um, I believe that would depend on, you know, if the food policy council was incorporated as a nonprofit or not. So you might just want to double check the organizational structure of the food policy council. Um, can all match be in the form of services, volunteer, et cetera? Um, I believe that it can. I, I don't think there's any restrictions or um, uh, requirements that a certain portion of your match must be cash versus in kind. Um, but again, that would be specified in the RFA if that was a limitation they were going to set on match. Um, Contact info for Paul Cotton and Jane Clary. Yes, we can include contact information for them in our follow-up email. Um, so yeah, again, Dr. Jane Clary had been the main contact for the CFP grant program for many years, and now she, this coming year she'll be sort of co-leading that with Paul Cotton. And yes, we can certainly share their contact info. Um, there's some questions about public food service provider and what that is exactly or what that means. Um, I unfortunately don't have a great answer to that question, um, but we can certainly look into it further for you all and, and see if we can share that out and get some more clarification. Um, I think that it is uh, not as clear as it could be of exactly what that means. Um, you know, I, I do read it as um, an, an intention to be 
more inclusive and who can apply. Um, but again, we can certainly try to dig into that and get an answer for you all. Um, can organizations apply for general operating support or is this funding solely project-based? Um, it is, it is project-based. Um, there, you know, again, in your indirect costs and that kind of thing, you, you do have some operating support that might be involved, but it is very much uh, primarily project-based. So they want to see, they, they would be providing funding for a specific project or program and not the general operating support. Um, someone said, I understand that an applicant needs two years of audited financials. What if the applicant has audited for 2015 and reviewed financials for 2016? Are they ineligible to apply? Um, I think for the audited financials, um, you would, you know, supply whatever you had available. Um, if you did not have an audit for a previous year, um, I might say to contact the awards management division and they they might be able to help you out and let you know what documents to include instead of audited financials if you don't have that available. Um, or maybe they would be fine with taking just the one year if that's all that was available. But yeah, I would definitely recommend following up with awards management division. Um, is there a definition of low income or do we have to demonstrate that people are low income through individual documentation of income? Um, no, I don't. There isn't an expectation that each project would define low income and have documentation themselves of people's income for the, the folks that they're serving through their project. I think if you have income, like general demographic information about the area where your project is taking place, and the expected population that will be served by your project. Um, I think those kind of general census or demographic pieces of information that are publicly available would be fine to kind of use as your definition for low income. And then similarly, what is the definition of an underserved population? Um, and CFP might go into further detail about how they define those populations. Um, again, language in the RFA is going to be very helpful, and I don't anticipate it will be greatly different from previous years. So I think starting with kind of looking through the 2017 RFA um, from last fall would be a great place to start. Um, so yeah, I guess I would direct you there for further definitions of, of the populations to be served. Um, let's see. What are the allowable and unallowable expenses? Um, so that will be defined again in the RFA. There will be information as well as another resource would be the NIFA application guide. Um, which is a download that you can get through grants.gov. Um, so when you download your application package to fill out all of your fields and submit your proposal, um, you'll also have the opportunity to download this um, application guide, which is further instructions. And it's a very dense and very long uh, <laughs> document, but it does have a lot of specific information, um, including allowable and unallowable expenses. So it'll just kind of define and clarify, you know, what what would be considered allowed or not. Um, so that's kind of a broad answer, but those those resources would certainly have any specifics for any particular questions pertaining to your project. Um, I think this is. Um, perhaps tied to a previous question. Um, thinking about how we can help small local businesses get licensed for processing for, I guess, local meat processing. Um, if you had further questions about that, feel free to chat that. I'll try to get get to that with a little more context. Um, let's see. If it may take about a year for the award announcement to be made, how can applicants design a timeline for activities? Would it make sense to state annually from date grant is awarded until end of award period? 
I don't know if I fully understand the question, but um, when you are putting together your application and proposal, um, I mean, definitely consider it for that project timeline. And, you know, I, I would encourage folks to design it for the specific dates that are involved for the project start date and end date. Um, so for, for CFP, um, again, in the RFA, it'll specify this. In years past, it will say that a grant project cannot start before September 30th of the fiscal year um, in which it's, which, which for which you're applying. So that would be September 30th of 2018. Um, so you can, for all intents and purposes, consider that the start date. And then depending on how many years you're applying for funding, it would be for, let's say, three years or perhaps four years, whatever the case may be. Um, so your timeline of activities would flow based on based on that. Um, let's see, another question about indirect cost rates. If our federally negotiated indirect cost rate is greater than 10%, do we use 10%? Essentially, is 10% the maximum? Um, it's my understanding that you can apply for your federally negotiated rate. 10%, um, the 10% de minimis, um, I believe, is intended for folks who don't have a negotiated rate. Um, in the RFA from last year, um, I was trying to look for further information about the indirect cost rate and if there is a maximum that they specify. Um, I just kind of anecdotally, I think 10% is, is fairly typical for people to apply for. Um, in some cases, I know like universities, for example, can have, um, you know, relatively high indirect cost rates that they have negotiated. Um, I think in those cases, it can get a little tricky and you might want to consider what would be reasonable, especially in consideration of total percentage of your project. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, that's not a better answer. Um, but I, I believe that if you have a federally negotiated rate that um, you can apply for your indirect to be that negotiated rate. Um, again, the awards man management division is an excellent resource and great people, very responsive. <laughs> so I'm sure they could help provide further clarity as well. Um, if your organization has been awarded this grant before, are you still eligible to apply? Um, is it more unlikely to be awarded? Um, so you may apply as long as there's not an overlap in the, actually I should double check that um, on if you can apply if you currently have an award, um, but certainly if you've received CFP in the past, you can't and, and you don't have a, an award actively happening, um, for that would overlap with the time period for your proposed project, you can certainly apply. Um, they do, do expect that the CFP projects will be different, so it cannot be funding for the same projects that you've applied for in the past and, and received funding for in the past. Um, and in terms of likelihood to be awarded or not, um, I don't know if, if there is a greater or lesser likelihood based on having been awarded before. Um, I mean, I think the fact that they 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 ask for very different um, projects um, for each application period um, tries to kind of address the fact that you know even if the same organization applies, it's for something very different to help them with this new and different project, perhaps. Um, so you would certainly still be eligible. Um, with the match, do we write what we know we have currently to match? It would be hard to project for September 2018 to September 2019 grant period. They do want to see that the match is in hand, um, especially in terms of cash. I think for in-kind, when we're talking about volunteer hours and things like that, you are, of course, like estimating what you would be expecting to happen during the project in the future. So there's some um, amount of, you know, estimation in terms of what do you currently have on hand versus what are you projecting you will have during the project period. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, it can certainly be tricky or difficult to project exactly what that might be, um, but they are looking for documentation and for something kind of confirmed about what your match will be. Um, can monies go to staff to do the work or reporting, et cetera? Can work from a prior, uh, let me see, um, can work from prior to application and during gap year be applied for matching funds or is that the 90 days? I'm not sure I totally understand the question. Um, I think this is asking about staff hours to do the grant reporting and if that can be applied as part of your match um, or if that can be applied as part of your funding overall. Um, I think that might get in the more of your indirect cost rate calculation just in that it is not, I mean, it, it is, it is um, part of your project. Um, I guess I also wouldn't anticipate that that would be a large portion of your staff time in terms of, um, you know, percent FTE or something like that of what you're calculating for personnel. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that that would be a large chunk of your of your salary uh, allocations. Um, but I guess if you have a more specific question, um, you can feel free to follow up with us about that. Um, and yeah, anything, any work that you do prior to September of 2018, um, any work that happens prior to the grant project start date would not be able to be applied as match. Um, let's see. And uh, just an FYI from a, an attendee here, local city government or city council will have demographic data such as per capita income to include um, for areas or districts of underserved locals, just FYI. So thank you. Um, so let's see, what is the application deadline? Uh, we won't know that until it is announced. So hopefully in October, we will have the full RFA period information and application deadline. Um, can you request the funding to be distributed in a graduated way if you're anticipating a large purchase during one of the grant years and you have laid out a strategic plan that explains that? Yeah, so that should be reflected in your budget and should say, you know, if you're anticipating XYZ costs in year one, year two, year three, et cetera. Um, so that should be accounted for there. Um, let's see. And I think I may have gotten to all of the questions at this point. Um, we're a little past two and um, I say feel free to reach out to, to us. We have Kristen Irvin's email address listed here um, for folks to follow up and we'll be sending out uh, a follow-up email with some of the resources and contact information we described. Mm -hmm. Any final notes? Yeah, um, well, thank you all so much, and thank you to Kristen for her expertise. Um, and I will probably try to go back through my list of Q&A. Um, there were a lot that were coming in just to make sure we covered everything. Again, um, please email me if you have any questions that we didn't cover. Um, if you would like any more assistance with um, talking through your project ideas for CFP. Um, and again, stay tuned for uh, information about our upcoming October webinar that'll talk more um, in depth about the application process for CFP. So we hope to see you all there if you're considering putting together a proposal, uh, unless we completely scared you off and you're like, no way. Um, <laughs> but either way, please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, so we'll um, sign off in a minute. Um, I'm just going to take a look through my questions, but this is um, this is effectively the end. So thank you all so much.